Welcome to uh, case studies in R. This is intended to be a very um, kind of a whiz bang, check out all the cool things you can do with R kind of demonstration. And it is cool, but it's intended to show the utility of R. It's also intended to build upon uh, the introduction to R series that I've been doing uh, this past year. I, I kind of flipped my intro workshop and we'll talk more about that. So I'm gonna try and start at a basic uh, level of being kind of fluent with tidyverse. And we won't review tidyverse really too much. We'll use tidyverse. And I'll show you how you can catch up after the fact if you wanna do that. Uh, but I'm glad to have you all here. Uh, if you will, please give me your attention. I like to start out with this land acknowledgement. So I'd like to take a moment to honor the land in Durham, North Carolina, Duke University sits on the ancestral land of the Shikori, the Eno, and the Catawba people. This institution of higher education is built on land stolen from those peoples. These tribes were here before the colonizers arrived. Additionally, this land has borne witness to over 400 years of the enslavement, torture, and systematic mistreatment of African, Ameri African people and their descendants. Recognizing this history is an honest attempt to break out beyond persistent patterns of colonization and to rewrite the erasure of indigenous and black peoples. There is value in acknowledging the history of our occupied spaces and places. And I hope that we can glimpse an understanding of these histories by recognizing the origins of collective journeys. So that's a very serious thing. And I thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to read that. Uh, we're going to move on to things that are more technical in nature and maybe not related, but uh, with any luck, one of you all budding scholars can use what you're learning today to help resolve or improve some of these injustices that we have. In any case, today's demonstration, as I said, is about web scraping. It's intended to be built on earlier workshops of gaining a certain level of fluency with Tidyverse. But if you're a newbie, I welcome you anyway. If you're a brand new beginner, uh, please stick around and listen. This workshop will be recorded. You can go back and watch that. And I'll, in a second, give you some links to some other materials. Uh, it's important to acknowledge at this point that uh, web scraping is fundamentally a deconstruction process, right? We're going to, we need to know just enough about the web so that we can break apart into its constituent parts, a website or some parts of a website. Uh, so in that spirit, we're gonna learn just enough HTML and cascading style sheets to understand how those technologies, which are foundational aspects of the web, understand how those technologies are important uh, for deconstructing a website. We're gonna use the library called Arvest, so if you haven't installed that and you're comfortable installing packages and you want to, and you want to try and code, on, code with me simultaneously, please uh, go ahead and install Arvest. We'll also use the PER library to iterate, specifically using the map function. Uh, for people who are more comfortable with base R, PER uh, is, or mapping is akin to, similar to, base R, old school, L apply, S apply, M apply. You could use those as well, uh, but I'm gonna use per. And um, that's a whole separate iteration is a whole separate workshop, but we'll, we'll learn just enough that we, you can see how it works. And along the way, I'll try and point out some useful documentation and resources. All right, so taping, taking a half step back, I just wanna sort of point out again that this is, building on uh, earlier workshops. Now that everybody's joined, I'm gonna put in this GitHub code URL again, and you're welcome to download that if you want. Uh, but rfun is a sub-branded site, something I came up with, which is really just to pull together all of the R resources that I use in teaching workshops. It's part of, it's a sub-brand for my center, the Center for Data and Visualization Sciences. And you can scroll through here and each one of these little squares represents some different aspect of learning about R. But when I say that we're, we're gonna build on that, we're really building on the quick start part. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna click into that just so you can see that there are some 
this is part of my flipped workshop. So what I did is I created smaller videos, 10, 20, 20 minute minutes. Some of them are a little bit longer, but not much that cover different aspects of R. So if I cover things that you're not familiar with, feel free to go back and watch some of these videos. Feel free to um, also check out, these are links to other videos. Um, Judith, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna click mute on your, on your microphone because it's, it's ringing a little bit. Um, anyway, um, if you know, I don't know that we're going to talk about joining and merging or assignments and pipes, but if you see stuff that you didn't recognize, you could go back and check those. And of course, I'm always available for consultations. So as I said, um, our fund is a sub brand for my center. So I'm going to find a link to my center uh, right there and just do a really quick, hopefully under two minute commercial Center for Data Visualization Sciences. We generally help answer questions on these support areas or these themes. Um, this is the full-time staff. So we do consulting. Well, often uh, the easiest way to get started with consulting is just to send an email to askdata at duke.edu. We offer a lot of workshops that are generally front-loaded on the beginning of the semester. Most of the time uh, for all of the workshops, there's a recording that's available after the fact and resources. You can usually find those recordings under this link, online learning. Uh, and then, as I had mentioned, uh, if you're just interested in the R stuff, uh, you could just go straight to R Fun and find videos and links and links to code and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, onward and upward. Oh, one other thing that I always like to mention, because um, I didn't, you can you can chat with us at, as well. We've been working on trying to make our lab available to people virtually. We have 12 workstations that are really powerful. So if you find that you're doing some kind of processing where your workstation is thrashing because of not enough RAM or whatever, uh, we've just created a, connected, a connection to those 12 machines in the lab, even though the lab's not open right now. And it's using a technology called Splashtop, which is a free, free download. So if you email us at Ask Data, we can give you a connection to a more powerful machine that has a curated list of dedicated data types of software, including R and Python and MATLAB and Tableau. A lot of the stuff that you can get anyway, but the, the advantage here is machines that have, uh, I think they all had 32 gig of RAM and a lot of things are memory bound. So it's, it can be handy, especially if your personal computer is, is being taxed. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is that uh, we also have two graduate students uh, who, who specifically, they're graduate students in uh, a program called computational economics. So it's kind of like a dual CS econ master's level uh, degree. And they help most often with statistical modeling questions uh, or advanced economics questions. So. Uh, the full-time staff generally kind of trying to fit into these themes, but if you do have a statistics, a statistics question in particular, our econ students do not make um, reservations for data consults. So you can just connect to them when they're available. So Annabelle or Hanling, and they're really helpful. You can just click on that green button to connect with them when they're available. So moving back to the slide deck, a uh, couple caveats on what we're going to do today. And if I haven't said it before, I'll just say this again. Uh, I want you to feel free to unmike and ask questions. And I don't think we have a full hour and a half worth of material. So I will definitely hang around as we're winding down if anybody has specific questions. And if you don't want to ask them today, uh, just again, remember that you know we do take consultations and I'm happy to meet with you. But caveats about web scraping. This is an important one. Uh, there's no real set of rules about how websites get developed. There are a lot of protocols and there are some standards, but every website is its own island in that sense. And, and basically, the older a website, the more likely you're going to run into some weird idiosyncrasies or inconsistencies. So I always like to point out, like, we're going to learn how to web scrape, but web scraping is as much of an art sometimes as it is a science. And sometimes just the inconsistencies that you run across become barriers to how you could automate the scraping. So keep that in mind. Um, you can do a lot, but you can also run into some really funny thorny issues that if you think of them as puzzles, they're, they're interesting puzzles to solve. 
another couple of suggestions or caveats to keep in mind. Uh, many websites have a terms of use uh, clause or a link, uh, particularly the larger websites that are really all about content. So you can think of anything from the New York Times and the Washington Post, which is copyrighted content to some of our larger bibliographic databases that you might be familiar with, like Nexus Uni or ProQuest or things like that. A lot of them have rules where they say, you are not allowed to scrape our website. Um, so you need to keep that in mind. The library has a Office of Scholarly, uh, Scholarly Communication and Copyright. And so we have staff that can help you understand how the terms of use may impact your research questions. Um, and uh, outside of the issues of copyright, sometimes there are reasons to, uh, you know, maybe investigative journalism or whatnot. There are reasons to do scraping that go outside of the lines. I'm not going to uh, advise you on that. I'm going to advise you just on the technical aspects of how you do web scraping. Uh, but it's important to understand what is officially allowed. And it's important to also understand that, like, the larger the website, the more likely they're looking for you. They have little robots set up to make sure that you don't break the rules, right? And one of the downsides that can happen, I'll just say this real quickly, is like if you decide you want to um, scrape all of ProQuest and, and they discover that, um, and I don't want to implicate ProQuest because I don't remember which companies, but some companies will do this. And the next thing you know, they'll shut down not only your ability to scrape their website, but they'll shut down the whole campus's ability to access their website until you know, the powers that be talk to the people and the perpetrators, if you want to call them that. Um, so all that is to say copyright is complex and there are financial reasons why companies who own data want you to follow their particular rules. It's also important to note that there are things called APIs or application program interfaces. Interacting with APIs and web scraping have a lot of similarities, but I just want to point out that one of the reasons why APIs exist is so that companies with big um, web properties can segregate traffic, right? One area, the web portal for point and click manual data gathering, the API is designed for machine to machine interactions. And by pushing traffic into different pipes, you ensure a high degree of um, robust experience for everybody who's using the site. So it's more than just copyright. And so anytime an API exists, you're probably gonna be more efficiently interacting with the API than you are writing a web scraper. So it's always a good technique to, you know, like if you identify a site and you go, I want that data, like a good great first step is just to Google, you know, does this company have an API? Can I get access to it? Is this open source site also have an API in addition to their website? Also, a lot of sites have uh, what's called a robots.txt file. That's a standard and you can look at more in there, but that's a standard that's developed in the early days of the web by um, search engines such as Google and, and other, other kinds of people, people that write um, robots that go out and scrape websites. And it's a good idea to honor those. It's a good idea to look for them and honor those. Uh, there's nothing forcing you to honor a robots.txt file. It's really kind of a notice, sort of like a no trespassing sign that um, if you've ever listened to Woody Guthrie, he says the best part about being uh, seeing a no trespassing sign is being on the backside of it. But uh, that's par I'm paraphrasing that and not representing it properly. But my point is, it's just a notice. It doesn't enforce that you can't go into that area of the website. Uh, but you should look for them and understand what the rules are. And then final caveat there, and I won't, and I won't go on too much longer, is that when you're writing these, what I'm going to call writing a, a robot, but it's a scraper, when you're writing that computationally, remember, you know, computers don't need to breathe. They don't need to pause. They don't need to take a step. And so if you write your web scraper kind of poorly, you can just, uh, you can accidentally pose as a denial of service attack, which is yet another reason why a web host might try and shut you down. An easy way to avoid that, and what's generally considered to be just kind of like good citizenship, is to just put a little pause between each iteration of every web page that you're gathering. And I'll show you how to do that just like a one second, two second pause, something to, to break up the amount of traffic that's being requested. All right, so just about two or three more slides. Let's just introduce the topic. Web scraping, generally speaking, uh, gathering or ingesting web pages for some kind of analysis. People who come to me, oftentimes they've never really approached the topic before and they just wanna know how to get started. So to them, web scraping 
is just that it's almost like there's a magic button. And there, in fact, are many magic buttons. But the easiest tool to use then is the RVEST libraries read underscore HTML uh, function, which basically does the same thing as if you clicked on a link or if you put a link into a web browser. It's just going to pull down all of the HTML and render it. And, and then in a web browser, it renders it so that you can read it. But outside of a web browser, you get down the raw HTML. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But what I also want to suggest to you is that web scraping is really at least these two parts, right? It's crawling and it's parsing. So crawling is not part of the RVEST library. Crawling is what I would call, in, in, in our context, the iteration. So you kind of have to develop this plan of what data do you want? How are you going to work your way through the navigation? That working your way through the navigation so that you can get every page or every element of what you want, that's what I'm going to call crawling. And we can use per map for that to iterate. You could also use S apply, L apply, and M apply, uh, or probably just uh, L apply. I'm not, I don't use those functions as much, so I couldn't advise you on that, but uh, map will work just fine. And then the other part, the real, uh, I think maybe to me the most exciting part of it is the, is the parsing, right? So we're gonna look at an HTML page here in just a second. Um, but, the primary functions that are going to be useful to us are HTML underscore nodes, HTML underscore text, and HTML underscore ATTR, which stands for attributes. And as I go forward, you'll start to see how those are useful. But all, all of them basically help you winnow down to just getting the information that you want. All right, so here is the world's simplest, most easy to read HTML document you've ever seen, just the part inside the gray box. Right, we're actually looking at a web page as it stands, but um, in any case, all HTML documents generally have an HTML opener and closer, and they usually have an opening body statement and a closing body statement. Most of them also have a header that exists above body, um, and sometimes there's even more information. There are things like this where this is a heading size one and a and a close heading tag, a paragraph opening tag and a close paragraph tag. This is called an anchor tag, and that's the close anchor tag. And the anchor tag has an attribute called an href, which stands for hyper reference or hypertext reference. And what you should see that is familiar to you is the hypertext reference is a URL or a destination to some other part, some other web page. Uh, if you were reading this in a web browser, all you would see is after it was rendered by the web browser, all you would see is a bold header that said my first heading, and then a paragraph that said my paragraph contains a link. That's the thing that you would click on to w3schools.com, right? So that's the trick is this is what you get back when you use read underscore HTML. And then we want to be able to identify which parts of that HTML structure help us identify what, do, what information we want. Maybe what we want are all the links on the page in which case we want all of the href attributes for the anchor tag, the a tag, right? Maybe we want something else. We'll work our way through some examples. Some additional uh, technical mark, it's not markup, and I'm not sure how to, how to refer to this, but some additional technical elements to a web page are cascading style sheets, right? So HTML, is a markup language that provides some structure to a document, like what's a header, what's a bulleted list, uh, what's a link, what's italics. But how the web browser renders those things is really kind of up to the web browser. And then the web author can further identify the, the style of which things get rendered, right? So in the previous example, we had a header size one. And if I didn't have any special cascading style sheet, but this is actually an example of a, of a header two right here. Generally, without any CSS, that would be rendered as some kind of like Times Roman or serif font, probably black in color, uh, probably about, I don't know, what is that, 20 point font. But a style sheet allows you to affect that, right? So I, I can tell it. I want it to show up in kind of a Duke blue with a sans serif font. That's what CSS does for you. Um, the elements that you would see in HTML of a CSS are things like div tags with class attributes and their arguments and span tags 
And both of them can have IDs or classes and have arguments. That's all you would see in the HTML if you really wanted to see a style sheet. And so let's just click on one right here. I'm going to open this one. This is actually the style sheet for the one that for the site we're going to scrape. It looks like this. It's not all that useful at this point. I just wanted you to see one. So for example, at some point, we're going to try and pull back some navigation. And here's the style sheet that identifies how the navigation bar appears. The reason why that's important is that um, the existence of style sheets almost indirectly adds more structure to the document so that you can use a combination of CSS and HTML to narrow down on just what parts of the site you're actually interested in, in gathering. All right, so I have this little slide here. Uh, and again, if you looked at the GitHub link that I sent you, there should be, a, you can download that whole file, uh, that whole repository. And there's a folder in there called slides and this slide deck is in there. Um, this is a general kind of workflow of what happens when you're web scraping, right? Most of the work is in the development phase. You want to put off the production phase as long as possible because of that issue of how you can sort of unleash an unsuspecting robot onto somebody else's site. And a lot of times when you do that, it takes some time. So you want to do plenty of development work. And the important phases are right, just looking at the raw HTML to figure out what you want back, uh, looking at the navigation of the site to figure out how you're going to work your way through it, and then developing a plan where you can parse and iterate, uh, and then finally putting the whole thing together. This particular, this is, I'm pretty certain my last slide, this is just a visual to kind of represent a different way to think about how, what a whole website might look like. If you think about it as a hierarchical tree where the homepage or your starting navigation point is the trunk of the tree. And then there's a series of branches that lead off into every sort of record of, on the tree. You can think of every web page final destination as a leaf on that branch from the root of the tree. And then, so what would happen is if you were iterating is you would go to the pagination and choose page one and page one might have a URL that you would then put into a different uh, part of your script. And you would go to that URL to, to parse out the title and the date and the press release and the subject, right? And then you would go to page two and you would, and you would separately pull down the URL for page two and get the data you want. It's just a different way to visually think about what you're about to accomplish. All right, that being said, it be a good time to ask if there are any questions. And if there are, I'll try and answer them now, and then we will transition to uh, our studio and I'll do a demonstration. Uh, John, uh, I have a question. So in the, the tree model, so for example, if I want to search articles from a website, which has a lot of pages, and I know a keyword that I want all the articles, which has that keywords, let's say election. And so do I need to go to each page or I can just give it the, the for example, New York Times, just give New York Times and it will go to each and every tab and page and pull me the articles and like from every tab and page or how we have to specify each page. So uh, I a lot of web scraping is context specific. So I, I think that um, your I think that as I understand your question, it probably is the case that you need to gather the URL for each of those results. Or but it might be, sorry. sorry. Yeah, so I'm saying, let's say I want when the articles were published, like the date of that article, which has elections. And I want to see for last two years. So it, it may very well be that the results page has all the information you want in which case you don't have to go beyond the results page, right? But if, if the results page is only a summary of an article and there's more information that's not in the summary that you want, then of course you do. I think that's the answer to your question. Okay. So anyway, I think the example that I'm gonna use uh, may help answer this question as well, because what we're gonna do is we're going to look at a results page and figure out how we can get the data that we want. John, I had another question as well. Um, uh -huh. Would you, like when we're looking at a website and we're trying to differentiate between HTML and CSS to be able to select things, 
is there is there like a way to know that sort of offhand i don't know our heuristic way um what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you a couple different tools that will help you identify what um what html tags are important for the for the data that you want to get back uh specifically we're going to look at something called selector gadget and it's probably also since you're asking that question right now let me just also point this out let's go to let's go to wikipedia um wikipedia.com and uh so if i do a view source on this view page source i'm in a chrome browser I can see just a whole mass of the HTML that makes that Wikipedia page relevant uh, or makes it render into something that I can read, right, which is right here. So that's one, aside from selector gadgets, sometimes you do actually have to look at the raw HTML. Uh, another thing that you can do, which is really handy, is, for example, if I wanted, uh, I'm trying to figure out how I can get this to happen. If I wanted this text right here, actually don't, let's, all right, let's look up Dolly Parton because uh, she was just in the news yesterday because she got her COVID vaccine. All right, <clears throat> so if I wanted this text right here, this is a good example. I could also, I could view the source and try and ferret through that page. I could also, in a Chrome browser, right click, get a context menu and choose inspect. Now this only works in a Chrome browser. But what happens is uh, inspect now gives me the ability to kind of selectively get some sense of what the different elements of the page are and drill down into them. So sometimes you're gonna use the Chrome browser to uh, inspect a different element. Like what makes, what if I wanted acting career and personal life and discography? Like what, what makes all of those show differently from all of the other words on the page? But the good news is there's even an easier way. And that's what my example is gonna show. We're gonna, we're gonna use this thing called selector gadget. But I, wanna, I want you to at least realize that there are these other elements, other techniques, because sometimes you have to go beyond the selector gadget. Depends on the complexity of the page. So let me, I'm gonna move my, I'm gonna move my, uh, some of my Zoom things around, Zoom boxes, and I'm going to change what screen you can see. Oh, before I do that, let's go back to, to here. This is, the, this is the repository for the code that I'm using today. I'm gonna to start off here in, in the 01 scrape underscore case study. Uh, I wonder why I wrote exercises there, but I did. I'm going to start off in 01.rmd. And if you've not uh, downloaded data from GitHub before, you can, you can click on the green button, download zip, and then you'll have to expand that. But let me go to my R Studio, where I already have this open. And like I said, I'm going to start off here in 01 scrape that underscore case studies. All right, so the first code chunk I'm going to run on this is, uh, you know, the code chunk that begins at line 18. And that the only tools that are really important for, for what we're going to see are Tidyverse and Arvest. The other two just allow me to do some, uh, some display of, of Creative Commons fonts down at the bottom of this document. But our best is for harvesting websites. Tidyverse is just generally useful. Now, this particular document has a ton of words in it. I tried to narrate exactly what's going on uh, so that it could be potentially a useful thing for you to reference later. But I'm not going to read very much of it today. We're just going to read the code. So the very first thing we do, let me, let me close that down, is we're going to use the read underscore HTML function. Uh, before we do that, let me open this, let me open this URL, copy, and go back to my website. If you'll excuse all of my zooming, I will show that site so we can, we can 
navigate to what we're doing here. Uh, share screen. There we go. So what the site we're going to try and scrape is this site called Ecartico. This came to my attention because last semester somebody asked me how to scrape this site. And I looked at it and thought it was an excellent case study for a workshop because it's a, it's a fairly austere site. It doesn't have a lot of extraneous HTML. It appears to be open source. I didn't see a terms of use document. I went to, uh, independently, I went to the root domain name and typed in robots, robots.txt. And when I got there, it says, it says forbidden, but that's not what a robot.txt file actually tells you. So that means what that's telling me is I don't believe they actually have a robot.txt file. Uh, if they have one, they're not allowing me to view it, which doesn't make any sense, which also is further evidence that there's no robots.txt file. But uh, all of this tells me, yeah, okay, I think it's a good site for me to, to scrape, uh, particularly in a workshop setting. Right, and the information that you'll find here is uh, from this university in Amsterdam, the Center for Study of the Golden Age, and it's information about, we can actually click the about, but it's basically information about some artists and artisans, mostly biographical information. So if I go to uh, Maria van Alst, uh, I can see some general information, biographical information about her and that she was married once, she had one child, and some other information. And in the end, the, the, the scenario that I want to try and set up for us today is my goal is to gather, to walk through this site and gather all of the names of all of the children and maybe the URLs, right? So typically, uh, I'm a little old school on this. My goal would maybe be to, just to, to do a quick view page source just to see uh, is this information kind of useful for me. So I might do a free text search on children, but this step is not absolutely necessary. It's just something that comforts me. So I'm recommending it to you. It might comfort you if you find it, if you find that it's confusing, of course, skip it. Uh, so that's my goal. John, can I actually back up and ask you about the robot? Sure. Uh, the, so, so it was when you were talking about that, they had, that it was forbidden, was the basic idea just that if they were thoughtful about wanting to restrict access or moderate access, they would have made a robot? No, uh, I was looking for a, um, that was probably not a good example. I was looking for a, a specific uh, robots.txt file response. So let me see if I can find one. Uh, here's, a, here's a good example of a, um, mm -hmm of a robots.txt response. So if you see something like this from a file, then it's always gonna be at the root. And it tells you, um, in this case, it's gonna say, oh, if there's an MSN bot, there's some things that I don't want the MSN bot to look at. And for everybody else represented by the user agent equals star, these are the things that I don't want your robot to look at. And so the fact that it said forbidden to me tells me that there's no file there. Ideally, I would want the web, web server to have responded 404 error not found, but it said forbidden. In either case, I can't read that there's a robot.txt file, so I'm making the assumption that therefore they don't have any restrictions for my robot. Does that answer your question? Yes, um, yes it does. Uh, okay. John, uh, following up on this question, um, so <clears throat> for example, I see that this is not allowed for me. So, so if I write a code and then start scraping, then why is there a problem? I mean, I am not allowed, so I'll not be able to get this information, but I can scrape whatever else is available. So I think we might want to come back to that question, Sid, but as I understand it, the short answer is that the robots.txt file is really intended to tell big automation robot uh, scraping sites such as Google and um, uh, Google, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute you if that's okay. Um, such as Google and some other and other big search engines like that, okay. so that um, so that you can you can alert if I if I'm a web host, I want to alert any random robot that I don't know about. Please don't come and search these particular sections. Um, but this is not uh, this is not an enforcement mechanism. This is more of a notice. 
So I say it's good to look at that just in case. So it gives you a sense of what the web host feels about their site. Um, but it won't prevent you from, from actually writing a robot to scrape their site. It's just more of a, of a of, you know, what, what prevents you, if anything, is lawyers, right? Uh, because most of the stuff that I'm going to show you is not going to prevent you from, is, it can't be shut down. What has to happen is, on a technical end, is, uh, you know, the web development team at that site would have to write robots searching for robots and then detect robots and then uh, block IP numbers and all that kind of stuff. And that's kind of outside of the scope of what we're talking about. Okay. So let's just assume openness. And um, uh, coming back to the scenario, we're going to try and gather the names of all the children from this site. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I want to start and get a sense of how do I navigate through this site. And I can look at this first page, and I can see that there are 50 names on here, and that there's also some navigation so that I can go 50 names at a time. And any one of those names, if I, if I click in on it, uh, this person has almost no information and there are no children listed, but that's okay. Uh, I can find the structure of the site. And this goes on for uh, about 20 pages, I think 22 pages total. And on any given, pay, any given summary page, there's not a link to every 50 page summary. There's just a link to about, what is that, seven or eight of them. Uh, so all of that information is useful to know. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read in page one. So let me skip back to uh, my R Studio and move around some Zoom windows. And that's what I did right here. I read in, or I'm going to read in page one of the first browse page. And you'll notice in my environments variable, I got back uh, a list of two items. I can look at that list and it doesn't look much like the HTML that I would see if I did a view source, but it has, this is, as I mentioned earlier, every HTML page has a body section. That's the stuff that I'm really interested in. And so that's there. Uh, that's what I'm going to end up parsing is the body of the HTML page, right? So this is just a review of what a body looks like. And uh, what we're really going to do is we're going to try and get the links to each person on that page. So uh, just to, uh, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to put in this code. Now, the magic question is, how do I get that code? So let me, once more time, uh, flip back to Icartico. You should see the Icartico page now. And what I want is I want these 50 names. And so that's where I'm going to use this selector gadget that I have downloaded earlier. If you go to selectorgadget.com, you can get this too. It's free. And when I, when I engage it, I can hover over all different parts of this page. And you'll see that every time it finds something that it's trying to uh, select, it also has a little bit of information under the orange box um, that I will share something in just a second. If anybody has a chance, share the GitHub URL to uh, Fuel. Uh, so there's a little bit of information there under the box. It tells me the elements that I want to capture. All right, let's see. Let's see. So going back to the site, Selector Gadget is engaged. I'm going to click on a name. And what happens is everything or a whole bunch of stuff gets highlighted in yellow. I can see down here that it has 71 different elements. I only want 50 names. So my next step uh, in Selector Gadget is very handy is I want to I want to eliminate things. And the, so I'm just going to click on things that it will automatically start eliminating. It's not like a control click or a shift click. It's just a click. And when I clicked on that, a whole class of things disappeared. I can see that I still have these four elements. And I don't want those either. So every time I click on something, this code changes. So I'm going to click on it again. And now I have this magic code. And I can see right here that I have 50 elements. There are 50 names. That's a pretty good thing. So I'm just going to uh, copy that into my buffer. Before And then uh, just for the moment, I'm going to close that down and just 
view source again so you can see what's going on here. Uh, it's these 50 names that I want, right? They all have a very common element. They have uh, an LI, which stands for a list item, which is the bullet that appears in the web browser. They have an A for an anchor tag, an href for the relative URL of the page, the, the text of, of the link to that page, and a closed anchor tag and a closed LI, right? So going back to our best or to our studio, I copied that code into my buffer and then I'm going to paste it right here. So remember earlier I gathered results by searching the URL of the first page. And now I'm going to paste that code as the first argument of HTML nodes. If I run just those two lines, uh, you can see that that's, that's the HTML that I wanted to single in on. And then I can pipe that to HTML text. And what that will do is give me just the text within the anchor reference, right? So there's the anchor reference tag, and then there's the text for the tag. So if I run that, I now have a vector of 50 items, which I can, which I put into uh, an object name called names. And I can build a uh, data frame out of that in a minute. So the other thing I want to do, same stuff, rather than getting the HTML text, I want to get the value of the uh, anchor reference href attribute. That is the value of this argument. And so I do that right there. And when I run that, it brings me back a 50 vector item list of the relative URLs, which is really useful. It doesn't have the full URL, so I'm going to have to build that up. Right, this is the base URL for the site. Oops, why did they do that? Okay, so that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to build that up. But let's first build a data frame of my results, right? Just using a standard uh, tidyverse function. I had already built the names function, I've already built the URL function. I'm going to now have a table of the first 50 names from the first link with the name and the relative URL. And then I'm going to transform that a little bit just by prepending the base URL in front of the relative URL. And I get back this link to the first 50 records. Ultimately, what I want to do is I want to get back, I want to generate a long sort of to-do list of all 2,200 names. But I have to gather 50 names at a time. That's the crawling part. So, so far what I've done is I've parsed, I've crawled one page and parsed the results for one page. And uh, what am I gonna do next? Now I'm going to uh, create a plan for crawling the rest of the navigation, okay? So moving back to my Ecartico site, and turning on selector gadget again, I want all of these links. So I'm gonna turn on selector gadget and I'm gonna click, uh -oh, let me click clear first. Yeah, I don't want just one. That's the mistake I made. I clicked on just one. That's not what I want. I wanna click this whole line. And I had sort of the same issue, right? Where I've got more results than I want. It tells me it has three items. One of them is this yellow one at the top. I don't want that. One of them is the green one. And one of them is this yellow one. It's a repeat of the one at the top. So it, if I had to gather both, that'd be fine. I could parse it in R. I could, I could do something with it. But using selector gadget, so far it thinks that what I want is anything called dot subnav, which is a class of a cascading style sheet element. But if I click on this, changes it to form plus subnav, and now one element. So again, sort of through the magic of selector gadget, I've got the stuff that I want. I just want this one line. These links for this one line is what I want to get back. So I'm going to copy this into my buffer and shift back to our studio. 
And that's what I pub I paste in this time to HTML nodes, right? So just to make sure that I've got the stuff I want, I pipe it to HTML text. Uh, although the, in this case, the text isn't all that useful for me. I'm just doing a verification here. What I really want is, again, remember, un, unparsed, it looks like this. And what I really want are the value of the href attributes. So just like I did before, same HTML node information and then HTML href. And that brings back for me a five element vector with a URL to each one of the navigation summary pages of 50 links. It doesn't have page one because I started on page one and page one doesn't, is not self-referential. So it starts with page two. It goes up, if you, if you looked at that, page, at that site, it would go page two, three, four, five, and then it has a dot, dot, dot ellipse. And then it has a link to the last page, page 22. So 50 links, 50, rough, maybe not on page 22, but otherwise 50 links on each page. So I wanted to build up that list of 1,100 URLs of 50 names on each page. And I'm going to do that sort of in the same way that I did before, right? I'm going to put it into a tibble because tibbles uh, in tidyverse are the easiest to navigate uh, row by row. And what I really want to do now is I just want to um, I want to build up a longer list by leveraging the, the information that I already have here. I know that I have a page one. I know that it goes through page 22. So I just want to use the tidyverse to make 22 rows where the last value is a little bit different. And that's what happens right here. Oh, wait a minute, I did something different here. Let's look at what I did here. I think I'm going very elementally. Um, added, I added a page number uh, variable by using some regular expressions to get the final digit of this free text, right? This is a, a character string. So just, just to make it clear what I just did there, and I would talk about this for a minute, is I wanted to get just the numbers, 2, 3, 4, 5, 22, because I want to manipulate that further. But I also, uh, in order to do that, I leveraged another part of the tidyverse, the stringer library, and in this case, specifically the string underscore extract function. But the stringer library is what, what extends R to be able to use regular expressions to find patterns in full text or in any, any kind of character um, vector. And so I wanna bring that to your attention because really anytime in R you're working with text, you're probably sooner or later gonna to wanna to be able to find sub patterns of the text. And the best way to do that is with regular expressions. Now, regular expressions have been around a long time since the 60s at least. It's the basis for find and replace in every application you've ever used, including Microsoft Word. Uh, but it actually also works a little bit differently in every programming language, like there's sort of dialects of regular expressions. And in R, the, the regular expression that I'm writing here says, take a digit, a digit symbol in, R, in an R regular expression is slash slash D. And then there's a multiplier. This says one or more digits. So anytime you see a pattern where there's one or more digits, and then there's an anchor. In this case, the, the dollar sign is an anchor for the end of the line. So that pattern is really saying, find for me any single or double digit numbers at the end of a line, right? Two, three, four, five, 22. Now we don't really have time to go into all of the specifics of regular expressions, but I just wanna interpret that for you and then tell you if you're gonna be successful at, at web parsing using R, you're probably gonna to wanna to learn more about regular expressions. They are incredibly extensible, but the basics of them, uh, you, could, you can learn in half an hour to an hour without any trouble, maybe five minutes. Maybe you just learned everything you just needed to know. But you'll see that I'm using regular expression right here again in string extract, and then another one in string replace. So let's break those down a little bit. What I have right now is that two column table 
with two, three, four, five, and 22. And I am going to, I'm going to do that again, where I, I guess I'm doing something repetitive here, where I'm extracting uh, something that I'm going to call navigation. And I'll interpret that regex for you in just a second. No, but, but just so you can see the results of it, what that regular expression did is it took everything before the page equals URL, right? Let's look at this again. This is what the URL looks like before. It ends in page equals and then a number. And what this string extract says is find everything that precedes an equal sign, which is, which is escaped with a double slash, followed by one or more digits that end at the end of the line, right? So it's basically saying, find this pattern for me. But really what it's saying is find this pattern and then take everything that precedes it, which is, which is that. And then uh, I'm also building up a page number thing, turning it into an integer. And I'm, uh, I'm just doing this for one line as it turns out. I'm saying anytime you see where page number equals begins and ends with a number two, replace it with a number one. And you'll see why I did that in just a second. But uh, that's going to turn this two into a one. And I did that because I want to I want to just use the tidyverse to expand the whole range from one to twenty two, which you can do with you can do a number of different ways. You don't have to do it this way, but this is just an easy way to do it. Right when I run that whole bit. Uh, I now have 22 rows and I have a page number subset it out for each of the 22 rows. And then the last thing that I'm doing is I am rebuilding my URL to be a full URL with the navigation and page number. Not sure why I'm doing that. I did this about several months ago. I started the code on this, but it's working. So uh, maybe I'm doing a few steps in a redundant fashion here, but here's a URL. And this is exactly what I want, right? I want a, actually can't even see the whole thing. Let's see if I can expand it. Yeah, I want the full URL rebuilt for all 22 pages. So that's my kind of my, my to-do list is that I'm going to, I'm going to crawl each one of those pages to then get links to each name. So this is where iteration comes in. Now I'm gonna use the map function. And this is another point to provide a cautionary note, right? I'm gonna map over the URLs in that table that I just built up here. Uh, but I don't really wanna unleash my robot just yet. I just, I still wanna be in development phase. So I'm putting in this, uh, this subsetting designation for the URL vector for that table, just so I can work with only three rows. Once I'm sure that this works, I'll take out that part there and later on in the code and unleash it on the whole, on the whole website. But I still wanna be a little conservative about uh, what I'm doing. So I'm going to build a table, a tibble, where I have a variable called HTML results that uh, looks at the first URL and it pauses for two seconds. That's part of the map function. And then it reads in the HTML for that first URL. After two seconds, it will uh, it'll read in that HTML and then it'll build up another, another URL. Because what I'm trying to do here is keep a record of everything that I gathered and where I gathered it from. And then it's going to go back and iterate and do that for the second row, and then go back and wait two seconds and iterate for the third row. So if we run this right now, this should take at least six seconds to run, because I only have the three rows that I'm running over. And I get back something that I think is a little surprising, but uh, so that's why I wanted to show it to you, is I got only three rows back. I just gathered the HTML body 
for the first three navigation pages. And that's all right here in this result set. That's the same result set that you saw up earlier in the, in the document. Anytime you read, use read HTML, you get a list that has a header and a body section. So we're gonna parse through that in a second. And then the other thing I have is just a, uh, again, this is like a guide for me or a record of where that information came from. So I know that the information in row one came from page one, the information in row two came from page two, et cetera. This is redundant information that after a while, but it's useful so that I can do some verification. All right, so then this is what I end up, I wanna parse through, right? I could have done this all in one step, but I wanna break it down so you see what's happening. Um, after, now I have a table. Let's look at it again, just so we can see what we're starting off with. Nope, not that one, this one. I have that three row set. And I'm now I'm gonna build up a new table where, that has a summary URL, right? That record of where I got the information and then maps through the information using HTML nodes and HTML attribute to pull out the URL for each name and to pull out the name using HTML text for each name. So if I run that, that's the iteration. Still a little bit confusing to me. I only have three rows uh, because what it did is it put a list for row one of the 50 names. That's right here. Sorry, come on, computer. That's a list of 50 names for row one first summary page, and that's the list of 50 URLs for the first summary page, so on and so forth down the line. But having those in a list is easy to unnest, right? You just use the unnest command. And when I run that, I now have 150 rows, so 50 rows for each page. So I have a designation of what page it came from. And as I scroll to the right, I have the relative URL, for the person I want to gather and the name for the person I want to gather, right? So all of this that I've done so far is really just about working the navigation of the site. I now have, I only have 150, but I could easily have 20, uh, 2,100 rows, one link for every leaf of the site, every person as a, as a end point on the, in the sort of, web database, if you will. And so then what I wanna do is I wanna to go to each one of those people's pages and further select information that I'm interested in. Remember from the beginning, I said, what I really wanna know is what are, the what are the names of the children that exist for any one uh, are in this whole data set? So I'm gonna copy this URL just so you can see kind of what step two is. And I'm sure at this point, you're getting a pretty clear sense, as I said in the beginning, that um, web scraping is really a process of deconstructing, right? And that's what I'm doing. I'm just sort of looking at the, at, at the information source that I have and trying to deconstruct it into its elemental parts. So here's an example of the final bit, right? Emmanuel Adriessen, if I'm saying that right, uh, is a male and born in Antwerp in the 16th century. And Emmanuel had three children. And I could, and you saw when I was using other examples earlier, um, some people have children listed, some don't have any children listed. That doesn't, that's not necessarily a definitive act of, uh, or account of whether or not they have kids, but it's a definitive account of whether or not this database knows that they have children. And I just wanna pull back a list of all of those known children. So I'm gonna to have to go to every website for every record and then parse, turning on my selector gadget. If I click on selector gadget, it comes back and it tells me I have seven elements. If I just parse the UL, which stands for unordered list, but I don't want the seven elements, right? I just want the three elements. So I'm gonna click on that. And now I've got four, so I don't want that. I'm gonna click on that. And now I've got one, 
which surprises me. Let me let me do this. Let me try something else here. Clear. Sometimes you kind of fiddle with it a little bit. Yeah, I guess that's what I want. Um, let me look at my code just to make sure that it's interesting. I came up with something different yesterday, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do it this way because this is seems to be better. I'm gonna click on a name and start unclicking the things I don't want, and I don't want that. Yeah. And now I have three elements and yeah. The other one might've worked as well, might've just required more parsing, but this is specifically what I want. I want three elements that I can iterate over and that's the little magic code. So I'll copy that into my buffer, go back to our studio. And you can see in my code right here that that's what I put right there right, in HTML nodes, just like I did with all of the others. So I read in that page into an object called Emmanuel, but in the future, I might just call it my page so that I can iterate over it. And then from every page, I'm gonna pull back that much of the HTML node, which will look like, which will look first, I have to read it in. And that would look like this. And so there are the children's names. And then it's just a matter of doing what I said, which was getting the HTML text for the children's names. So if I run that whole thing, there I have that vector of three children. So I didn't, for this exercise, I did not go through the process of then further iterating on this page because I've showed you the sort of the the technique where you can iterate, and I've shown you the technique where you can read in. And I don't want to unleash 20 of us um, on this site uh, because quite honestly, it's a university site. They probably didn't design their site to have to be a part of an, a model classroom. I don't want to overwhelm them, but I'm sure if you do work on your own, they'll be fine with it. Um, but those are, when I say those, all of those concerns I have, those are the kinds of concerns I want you to have when you approach web scraping. Like it's, I don't wanna say that it's not okay to just scrape whatever you want, but you should have some concern about the idea that you can just scrape whatever you want because lots of things can happen. You can accidentally scrape copyrighted material that you have no right to. You can accidentally pose as a denial of service attack and they can shut you down. And that's the worst part. It's not, it's not that uh, I wanna get overly litigious about the rules. It's, I want you to be able to accomplish what you want. And if you get shut down by their web server, then what are you gonna do, right? You know, you gotta go find another machine that their web server doesn't know about and move your code over. Whole thing is not, is not worth the hassle. It's just better to sort of operate all of the above board process. Um, um, let's see, I hear somebody asking a question and now's a great time to ask because I'm at the bottom of my code, so please. Please uh, ask away. So, so John, um, so as I understand that if we have to pull the data, we need to first create a data frame with the links, all the links from where we want to get the data from, all the pages, like people's pages links, right? Right, that's, um, that's sort of the answer to, to your question. Go ahead, Sid. Yeah, so, but my follow-up question is for, because I was thinking about it. For example, I want to pull data from New York Times, and for example, I want to pull that the Dakota Pipeline articles and when they were published. Now I have to go and search. Do the because the article. If you open a page, US, just go to New York Times and click on US. It, the, the the latest articles will be there. So I have to go to search and type Dakota Pipeline and all the articles which have been published in last seven eight years will come online. So. I have to go to each article, open the link, and then get that. So um, let's just let's. I I would tell you first off, Sid, that I am pretty certain that when you look in the terms of use, that the New York Times does not want you to scrape their site. Okay. Um, but uh, let's put in Dakota Pipeline. I'm a subscriber, so I I should be allowed to do this. Um, 
And there may be other sources for this information for you. And that's, that's something I might be able to help you with. Um, okay. But if you look up at the URL, right, that's the base URL that you want to start with, mm -hmm. is a query that is going to pull back, in this case, 1,030 results. Now, the problem that you're going to have with this is that in order to get more than the first looks like 20 or 15, you have to click on show more. Right. So, um, <clears throat> so one of the things you're going to have to do is figure out, uh, let's, let's do that again. Let me hit F5 and took it. If I hover over show more, I don't have any um, indication that that's a link. Uh, so this, this brings in a whole nother um, complexity to, to web scraping. I'm pretty certain that what makes that particular bit work, that show more button is something, some, some JavaScript technology. Uh -huh. And so now you need to be able to respond to the results that come back. So if I do a view source on this, I'm gonna actually, before I do view source, let's do a selector gadget and just see if it tells us what show more is doing. Ah, it's a thing called a div button. Um, let's have a quick look at the view source under, let's type in button. Yeah, that's, there are 37 of them, but uh, da, 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 maybe it's the last one. Maybe I'll look at show more. There we go. Um, and then the, the question is, how do I react to that? And I will tell you off the start, I don't actually know. I might show more, I, I might uh, view source. I use my selector gadget. I'm probably gonna try um, that other technique that I mentioned where I inspect it, see if I can get any kind of clues as to what, what I would do to get it to respond to this. Now, having seen all this, I can tell you two more things. Um, one is you don't have to use R to do web scraping. There are lots of other tools. <clears throat> and there is a tool that I really, really like called, um, as a matter of fact, I'm pretty certain I have it up here. Yeah, webscraper.io, which the last time I looked, um, webscraper.io was free. And I am certain the last time I looked that webscraper.io has a built-in, uh-oh, that didn't work, did it? Let's try this again. Let's just web scraper.io. Do it as a search and see what happens. Okay. They have pricing information. Yeah, they have a free tier. Good. And I'm certain that they have a mechanism um, built in to go past that show more button. So that, that's one option. Another option is to look in the RVEST uh, documentation to see if they have a technique for iterating and interacting with, um, with a JavaScript button like that. Another option is to run something called a headless Chrome browser, which is basically a command line tool that doesn't have a visual rendering engine. So it'll use Chrome to gather data and it'll pull it back. And then there will be other other uh, things that you'll have to learn about headless Chrome browsing, but you can do that. And still another option, bringing it back into our studio. Like there's two art studio options and there's two outside of our studio options. The outside of our studio options are headless Chrome or web, or at least webscraper.io. There are literally thousands of web scraping applications out there. A lot of them cost money, but in my experience, I've never found one that costs money that's any better than webscraper.io, which happens to be free. Um, but the in our options are learn more about our best on how it could interact with that show more button. Or there is a other package called R Selenium. And I'm certain that R Selenium could do this. Uh, I have never used R Selenium, but uh, R Selenium is more advanced than R best. And so if R best can't do it, the nice thing about R best is that it's sort of easy to learn and works for a lot of cases. But if it has a technical limitation on interacting with JavaScript buttons, I feel pretty certain that R Selenium does not have that technical limitation. 
And, I've actually used our Selenium, and uh -huh. you can definitely like click on on things using it, even like JavaScript. Good, base. good. Um, Thank you. It's a little bit. It's a pain to download. That's the part that's annoying. Like I, it took me I think two hours because I just didn't understand what was what it needed. But uh, once I did download it, it was not that difficult to to build things. That's great information, Stefan. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, the thing about web scraping is that I found is that you always end up with a problem that you're not quite sure how to solve. And uh, so Arvest is a great way to start because it, like I said, it's sort of, it's very consistent and it's a good way to start out, but it maybe is not as advanced as R Selenium. Uh, and as you might imagine with a name like R Selenium, there's actually a package out there called Selenium that may have been first developed for Python. And so R Selenium is just the port of that. Uh, but it might be a little harder to get started with our selenium. In any case, based on what we just talked about today, uh, hopefully you would you would have a little easier time than approaching it from scratch. So the time the time that Stefan you had to spend a day or two getting comfortable with our selenium, hopefully some some others can avoid based on your input. And I'm happy to look in some of the stuff with you, but uh, in many cases with with uh, web scraping, like I said, you just run across these errors that you've never seen before, and you just have to kind of break them down into little, little elemental parts and see what can be done. Okay. In terms of our Selenium, I was just going to say the biggest difficulty I had in installing it was that you get the choice between trying to run basically your own browser through another um, R package, but that R package or whatever it leads to doesn't actually work. So you then have to actually install like Selenium or, or Docker. <clears throat> so like another download to then be able to use our Selenium as like a virtual machine in your computer. Um, right. But it works <laughs> once, you, it works. once you do all that. <laughs> so, um... Let's see, I see I've got some questions in chat that I maybe haven't been answering. So let me go back and, and look at some of those. Seth Morgan said, oh, Seth Morgan is gone. Got, got to go to another seminar. Okay, well, I'm glad, Seth, you could join. Uh, Marco says, could you walk us through scraping data tables for the web using R for Excel? Uh, I've never used R for Excel, uh, but uh, as it turns out, scraping data tables is probably one of the, the simpler things. Uh, let's see if we can find, I'm trying to think of where an example of a table would be. Uh, but let's, meantime, let, maybe let's look up R for Excel. And if I, if I can shed any advice while we're meeting, I will do that. R for Excel. Or unless I'm misinterpreting your question, Marcos, are you saying, I assume that there's some package called R for Excel. Is that what you're saying? Marcos may be gone, um, but feel free to type in, if you know, homepage R for Excel users. Ah, here we go. Well, this might be, this is different. That's advice. All right, let's see, R, I'm not sure how to interpret that question. R scraping HTML tables. Let's just do that. Scraping tables. Maybe it's maybe the question is how do you how do you ingest Excel tables? Um, yeah. And let's see. Uh, Rebecca says so. Uh, let's wait for Marcos to clarify what the question is. Rebecca says, could you elaborate a bit on the process of creating a web scraper? to download and store files, for example, PDF, in any recommended packages or scripts. All right, so uh, <clears throat> if you have a collection of PDFs that are available through a website, and this is actually something I hadn't, hadn't discussed fully, but let me just say this. This is from years of working in a library that, uh, and, and actually, believe it or not, 20 years ago, I was actually working as a web developer. But one of the things that I discovered was that while you can spend time writing scripts to download chunks of information, particularly if it's open source, uh, particularly if it's a governmental or quasi-governmental organization, 
Sometimes the easiest way to get that data is to pick up the phone or get your email and reach out to the, the web host and say, hey, can I have all of your information? And I mean, honestly, if they say yes to that and it's, and it's free and legal and it takes you three minutes, um, that, will, that will save you so much time. But uh, that aside, that's, that's the social engineering side of, of gathering information. If there's a website that has links to a bunch of PDF documents, it's going to be very similar to what we just discovered. Um, I'm not sure which screen I'm sharing. Let me see here. Okay, I'm sharing the, the web browser. Like if this is a, rather than a link to an HTML, it's a link to a, uh, a PDF document, then we should be able to, there, I'm, I'm wondering if there's an alternative to uh, read Excel that's just download. And maybe actually download would work because there's a download file, download, download.file r that will, should take a, a URL as one of its, yeah, download file takes a URL as one of its arguments. So that rather than using read underscore HTML, you would just use the argument, um, I'm going to put it up here in the URL because I can type it, but this would be an argument in your script. Download dot file open paren URL equals, for example, um, uh, https foo.com. I need two colons there. Not that this is going to work. Slash my document dot PDF. And then, of course, you would assign that. Uh, to some object for iteration, my, my PDF. You'll excuse the pseudo code there. That should work as a means of downloading PDFs. Now there are a whole bunch of um, other R packages for scraping through PDF documents. Let me see if I can find some of them. Uh, PD, PDF tables. Uh, tabula is one, um, uh, but here we go. I think this is this might be it. Yeah, there's another one. The same people who have R Selenium uh, made this tool called the PDF Tools Package. So if it's PDF documents you're after, you might actually start with this package called PDF Tools, which should help you not, uh, the ingesting again is not necessarily specific to RVEST or PDF Tools, but the um, parsing of the PDF markup to, into data, which would have a, uh, uh, a similarity to what we just did, right? We just parsed HTML to get raw data. But what you're going to want to do in that case is parse PDF to, to raw data. So you might want to use something like that. Um, and <clears throat> again, I'm happy to, take, uh, to set up consultations with people on details. So I'm going to put in this URL. Some of you may know this, but um, if, you, if you want to set up a consultation with me, you're welcome to. That URL will help you just schedule it based on your own time. Uh, Marcos wrote back and said, what I meant was to scrape data from the web, like data tables of public financial reporting, using R and then exporting them to Excel. Right. So. <clears throat> Thank you, Marcos. Um, so the scraping part would be similar, particularly if it's public data tables, because uh, I'm trying to now, first of all, I would say this that um, financial data in particular, a lot of times, um, if it's public financial data, there are lots of sources of that information. So you may be able to get a download quite simply without having to write a web scrape. But um, example uh, HTML table. Let's let's see if we can find a. And maybe this is an example. Uh, expect element. Yeah, that's a table right there. You can see there's the table tag, and there's uh, a table body and a bunch of tr rows. So let's just real quickly. So what you would do is you could you could download that table and to a data frame. And then, of course, you would just write out as Excel. Um, so write underscore 
I'm pretty certain right under score Excel is a function in the, um, let me switch back to my R studio. And let's get a notebook going here. And how are we doing on time? Are we going until three o'clock and we're almost done? Um, so let me just keep on going here. But if you have to go, I understand. I appreciate everybody who came. Verse and library Excel. What is the, what is this? I can't remember what the name of the, um, import data set from Excel. It's called read Excel, you know, copy. Pencil. So library read Excel. And then read Excel just for writing out, read Excel, write. Hmm, I don't see it there, but I, I don't, I'm sure there is a way to do that. Um, it does, maybe it's not part of read Excel. We'll have to find a different package. I'm 100% certain there's a way to do that. But let's, let's do this, copy, call it my table, or I'm gonna call it my doc my HTML doc. And we also, we already loaded our best, but that's what we're gonna do, library. R, helps if I spell it right. Our best. And then read underscore HTML. And let's just, for the fun of it, have a look at that. Right, so it's gonna be in the body of that message. So we're gonna, uh, my underscore HTML doc, HTML nodes, nodes. And remember that we can use selector gadget to figure out exactly what we want. Let's try that. Let's try to put that into practice. Um, here's my selector gadget and I'm gonna click on Yeah, those are all TRs. Let's see if, if I click on that. Oh, that's interesting. Um, this could be a little bit of a challenge, but let's see what we get. We'll put that in there. Nope, not that. I don't really like that. Hold on, let me see if I can get something different here. Clear. I'm just, oh, there we go. Well, TDs would do it. And then this would be a TH. Uh, let's just see what we get with TDs. But well, it says 46, I don't want 46. Uh, well, where are the others? I don't know why it says 46. Oh, here we go. I don't want this. Now that's 18. And that, by the way, I'm looking at this number right here. Um, so that's pretty good. Let's. Let's, oh, customers TD, that's good, I like that. Maybe customers would work. Copy. And we'll put this in here. And um, does that look right for what my source was? I got Alfred. And Maria's row two. So this isn't quite exactly how I want it because what I really want to do is I want to gather almost by column. And so let me, give me a chance to, to refine what I'm doing here. I don't want that. No, that looks good. So use, I know that you can't see what I'm doing but trust that I'm just using selector gadget to highlight what I want. There we go. Now we're cooking. Um, so now I've got Alfred through, uh, yeah, that's the first column, right? So then I could uh, HTML underscore text. And I'm going to call this uh, call one. 
And, and then I'm just gonna do this where I say, uh, my, my downloaded Tibble is Tibble call one first, just so it's not ambiguous, first column equals call one and my down the table. And if I run both of those, so there I have, um, and I don't know why it didn't occur to me, but anyway, there I've, I've gathered column one. So I would have to iterate. I mean, there's a number of different ways to iterate. And then even though I was looking for a read Excel, like I can always write underscore CSV, uh, my downloaded tibble to uh, my, my dot CSV. And of course, now that I have a CSV file, that should show up down here. Let's just run it and see what happens. Yeah, now that I have a CSV file, I can easily import that into Excel. So uh, I hope that that got close to answering uh, Marco's question. Oh yeah, Rebecca has an input. There's a write underscore XS, XLSX, which could be used directly. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Oh, somebody asked, when's the next webinar? Um, Next webinar is uh, it's coming up soon. Let me look at my schedule. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to our fund first because it might be down here at the bottom. Let's see, spring workshops. Today is. March 4th. So uh, on March 16th, I'm doing another intro to R for the Data Fest contest. That's something sponsored by the Stats Department. Um, my colleague, uh, Angela Zoss, is doing a visualization on R. And, and if you haven't had a chance to, to attend one of Angela's workshops, she is extraordinary, knows a great deal about visualization uh, and R. Um, I'm going to do a Twitter data gathering workshop on the 25th. I'm going to do how to, how to make the slides. Those slides that I showed you today are done in a, program, a package called Sharingan. I'll show you how to use Sharingan on the 6th of April. And then kind of picking up on web scraping and Twitter gathering, we'll do a little bit of sentiment analysis on the 15th of April. So that's that. Y'all have a great day.